good afternoon, everybody. Um, not, not everybody knows um, uh, Mike, uh, myself, and Cress, but just as by way of a, a of a brief in introduction, um, Cress and myself milk um, a hundred, about a hundred and thirty uh, sheep here on our property here in the Southern Highlands. We've got uh, we've got a hundred and eighty acres um, that we that we own ourselves um, in this lush um, part of the escarpment just before it drops down to the coast, Kiama and Wollongong. Um, we get very high rainfall here, so it's, uh, we get about 1.8 metres of rain a year. And most of the operation is uh, just done by Cress and, our, and myself. We have a couple of casuals that come in and out. Um, our, our business is probably a, a third farmer's market, a third restaurant, a third retailers. Um, we, uh, we believe that we live in a very special part of the world and our farm and our animals are very, uh, very important to us. And we really want that to express itself, our, our whole farm. Uh, we want our whole farm to, um, to be expressed in the cheese that we make. So we decided to, uh, we decided very early on when we were setting up that, um, that we wanted to be ready for the time when, uh, when Australia allowed raw milk cheese to be made. Um, my, uh, my motivation for saying yes to, to Jenny's kind request to present today is, um, is, is not one about grandstanding or talking about how good we are. That's not what this, um, that's not what this presentation is about. Um, this presentation is about um, Australia has gone on a very long and arduous journey to get to a point where we've been able to make raw milk cheeses. There's an enormous amount of science. There's been an enormous amount of administration, negotiating, collaboration by lots of different parties. Um, lots, of, lots of help from ASCA. Um, we've done a lot of representation and a lot of hard work with the New South Wales Food Authority. The food authorities have done an enormous amount of science. Um, so today is really just helping us all understand a little bit about um, a snapshot of where we came from and really about where the authorities are coming from, what the food, uh, what, what the food safety component part is. So we understanding how to make safe raw milk cheese. We'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the approval process um, and we'll talk a little bit about, um, about some challenges. So, Today's presentation is supposed to be quite educational and informative. Um, so, um, before we get into that, why don't, um, why don't we do um, just a little bit of shameless self-promotion. <laughs> so anyway, sit back and watch this for a moment. Australia's first raw milk cheese. We called it Yarrawa because it's the indigenous name for the small pocket of cool climate rainforest that you find on our farm. Cheese is an expression of the land. which allows you to taste the entire story from the big picture, the pasture, the seasons, the animals, right down to the microbiological level. What makes
makes this type of cheese totally safe is that it has a mandatory maturation period. And over that time, all the potentially harmful bacteria die away. Yarrow is a semi-hard sheet milk cheese. It's placed as flexible, not as hard as a cheddar. It's mellow, it's got a mellow taste, quite nutty and grassy with hints of sweetness. It's quite unique in its taste. It really basically encapsulates the landscape. that um i'm hoping that this year's crop of votes is going to look as good as that one was as that one did so um but the real reason why i showed that video is basically just to answer the why piece you know why would you why some people perhaps not so kindly would say why would you bother making raw milk cheese if it uh if it's if it's that um, if it's that difficult and if there are that many hoops to jump through, well, why would you bother? Well, I, I think it's really important for the, for both us and for the industry, but let's just talk about us. Um, our strength being uh, a single source farmhouse artisan cheese making operation is terroir and provenance. So they're, they're the things that we have that, that the big guys or even imported cheeses to maybe even a lesser extent, but still, they're the, they're the sorts of things that are unique to us. It's the things that um, are really important to our restaurant customers. And it's the reason why um, people keep coming back to us every week at Farmer's Market because they know where their product comes from. Um, and so, you know, terroir and provenance, especially terroir has sort of been that elusive, um, that elusive thing in cheese making where we, where it's, it's kind of hard to grasp in the same way that it is with wine. You know, we know that uh, a Coonawarra Cabernet is going to taste all cassis and minty and, you know, we know that um, we know that a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc is going to going to be grassy and passion fruit. We know these things. So, how do we bring the same concept to, to cheese making? It's it's uh, it's not as straightforward, that's for sure. But um, but I read recently um, the the book by Bronwyn Percival about. Um, about real cheese, and and she says, and it's something that struck Cressida and I very um, very strongly, that cheese is the only food stuff that can represent an entire farming system on a plate. So for us, um, if you taste some of our Yarrower, which is pictured there, which we're now making in a larger format, you can see that. Excuse me. Um, it is going to be different depending on what time of the year um, you're 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 buying that cheese. We know that the season is going to play a large part, especially in a cool climate area like what we have, where we have where we have frost. Yet, yeah, and we've got you know reasonably warm summers. We know that there's going to be different microbiology around the farm, um, depending on whether it's the hot humidity of summer compared to the cold dryness of winter. We know that there's going to be different pastures that are going to be growing in different times of the year, and sometimes we'll have different crops. We know that especially 
with a seasonal animal like, like sheep, we know that the lactation cycle matters greatly. We know that right now um, our milk is, um, I haven't tested it actually recently for, for, its, um, for its composition, but I'm imagining that the fat content is probably, you know, double digits or close to. Um, so we know that the milk changes quite markedly over the year. We know that that fat content, by the way, in spring is probably more like 4% or something like that. So we know that that's going to have, uh, we know that that's going to play a part in the texture. We know that that's going to play a part in the moisture content. We know it's going to play a part in, um, in, in the, in the flavour profile. And we know that right throughout the year, there is going to, there is going to be a changing microbiome. Um, we already know that at certain times of the year, you need to watch out, for instance, for blowing. Um, and, and that's probably more of a risk factor than other times. So that's, that's a very clear example about how the microbiology on your farm changes. And there's really no other product that does that. That, does that. You know, wine doesn't meat doesn't that is encapsulate everything from the from the macro factors right down to the microbiological factors so in a lot of ways um in a lot of ways cheese is really exciting and here in australia we can you know we've got great assets because we're um we're part we've got by and large pasture-based systems which europe and and a lot of the United States don't, don't have. Our, our animals are being grazed on grass, by and large, in dairy systems here in Australia. So we do have this great story to tell. Um, and, you know, raw milk cheese, in our opinion, is the best way to express that, to express that in a particular cheese. Um, we also we also know that um, there can be a sameness um, in certain styles of cheese. If you've got um, if you've got the same animals, you've got the same industrial cultures. Um, you, you know, there's there's um, there's a limit to the interesting the interesting variations and flavors that you can get out of those scenarios. So. So a, a raw milk cheese in a in a scenario like ours, it's very different. You can see in that picture that there's a little luggage tag that we attach to our cheeses, um, our raw milk cheeses. So this one says late spring, tells us the make date, and it tells us that the sheep were eating rye grass at the time. So you know it's a it's a little thing that starts to help people understand what a cheese will do at certain parts of the year. It's really, uh, it's really important that we have a chat right up front about what is raw milk cheese. So the, the popular definition, which I don't seek to change, it's, it, it is what it is. And the popular definition is if cultures and rennet are added to raw milk, then that's a raw milk cheese. Let's pop that aside for a moment because as soon as we start to talk about food safety and we start to talk about the food authorities, their definition of a raw milk cheese is something very different. It, it, is, a, it is a brand new category. Um, raw milk cheese to, uh, to FSANS and the state-based authority is a cheese that's neither been pasteurised or thermised and where the curd remains uncooked. So, and in in that way, we do have a brand new category. And at the moment, um, uh, it, it doesn't give me much joy actually to say that we're the only ones that have been approved um, to make uh, a couple of cheeses, which is our semi-hard and the feta. And one of the things that I really hope is that some of the people listening to this uh, webinar today will feel that extra little bit of motivation to make the next step, and to and to um, and to make um, uncooked raw milk cheeses, uncooked curd raw milk cheeses themselves. 
we certainly don't want to be the only ones in Australia. We're happy to be the first, but we don't want to be the only ones. And um, we're happy to share our information and happy to support others in the industry. Um, so it's, it, also, it also requires explanations to some people to say what, what a raw milk what a raw milk cheese actually is and how it differs from a conventional cheese. Because for some people, they'll hear raw milk cheese and they'll think of risks. By the way, thanks to, that's, a, that's obviously a Bruni Island cheese there. It's not, that's not ours, but I pilfered it because I was looking for photos for the, for the PowerPoint presentation. But, um, but making raw milk cheese is not about crossing our fingers and hoping for the best. It really isn't. Conventional cheese obviously inactivates pathogens by pasteurising the milk. But raw milk cheese, cheeses also inactivate pathogens. They just inactivate them through a completely different way, through maturation. The idea being that um, if you make a raw milk cheese that's a hostile environment for pathogens, then eventually time and temperature will finish them off. So it's part of the education piece that raw milk cheese, properly made and matured, is innately no more risky than a conventional cheese. Um, what makes what makes a safe cheese? Well, we've just we've just um, spoken about that little little bit. The target organisms that we're worried about, obviously, are the four majors, E. coli, Listeria, Salmonella, Staphylococcus, Aurea. Um, so we already know that, you know, some people, um, that conventional cheeses use pasteurisation. We know that um, there are some raw milk cheeses, like what Tim makes, Bruni Island. Um, uh, I think uh, Woodside have from time to time, Marook Farm. There's quite a few people in Australia making um, uh, cooked curd cheeses that quite rightly are called raw milk, raw milk cheeses, but they are cooked curd. We've seen some milk that's cold pressed. So they sort of simulate, um, you know, that they, they simulate a high pressure uh, scenario like, uh, like seven kilometers underneath the surface of the ocean or something. But this is a brand new weapon that we have, that is to create a maturation environment that ensures bacterial dieback. And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the science of killing bacteria through maturation. Um, I won't spend too much on this slide, only to say that the history has, uh, of raw milk cheese in Australia has been very ad hoc. You know, we had, um, we had some exemptions here, some exemptions there. We had the great Will Stud Rock Four funeral. Um, you know, then there was the exemption that was made in the Food Standards Code to Rock Four. We saw, um, we saw brand new cheeses in the category, like, like uh, Brooding Island C2. But again, we had this pickledy pickledy ad hoc scenario. Um, and we really got to a point where, you know, in, two, in 2014, 2015, there was a new raw milk cheese standard finalized by FSAMS. And it had to be so. I mean, for years we had this unlevel playing field. We had obviously cheeses like Gruyere, Emmental, Roquefort, being imported into this country where near identical local products remained illegal. And, and to this day, yeah, um, to, to this day, there's no clear mechanism by which Australian cheesemakers could make a rock for. So it, it's right that it right, it's right that it was dealt with. And it was right that um, we spent an enormous amount of science, uh, that FSANTS and the Food Authority spent an enormous amount of science to, to ensure that, um, that 
we levelled out that playing field and that Australian cheesemakers had an opportunity to make raw milk cheeses. But really, these were just baby steps. So in 2000, well, I think it was very late 2014, actually. But anyway, let's say 2015, the FSANS code was amended so that, um, so that Australian producers were now able to make raw milk cheese. And to avoid the problems that had been seen in the UK and Europe and the USA, there was a focus on two big major qualifying criteria. One, that there would be a clean final product and that B, that final product couldn't be a reservoir for new pathogens. And I, I think a, a lot of us, including a lot of the people listening to this webinar, all sort of looked at each other and thought, well, you know, that's great, but there was just simply no regulatory framework that we could implement that. It, it left us, it, the, the landing of the new, uh, the, the, the new amendments to the, to the code really left us in a position that was no different than what it was before. It essentially laid out a process where it would cost many, many thousands of dollars for cheesemakers to do challenge tests in order to fulfill the requirements set down by the code. So work to do yet. Well, before, before we go into how we, how we got from the, amend the, the, uh, the amendments to where we are today, we really under need to understand the mindset of the food authority. We need to understand what the international context is as well. So in the UK, they've had some eight outbreaks since 1983, most of them E. coli. Um, we've seen some argy-bargy recently between um, in, in Scotland between a food authority and, um, and, and cheese makers where the environment had gotten a bit hostile, it, might be, it must be said. And that's a, that's a scenario that we really need to avoid in this country. We do not need to have a, um, an adversarial approach with our, with our food authority. But in any case, um, the approach overseas seems to focus on STEX, STEX for, um, for, for those not familiar with that term, uh, Shiga toxin, Shiga toxin uh, E. coli, um, producing E. coli. Um, and, uh, and that is sort of a bit of a canary down the coal mine test for a lot of raw milk cheeses over there. In the USA, um, between 2009 and 2014, um, it, it, I, couldn't, I couldn't find the data to strip it out, but anyway, there were 14 deaths from cheese, both raw milk and pasteurized. Um, in the US, um, rather than, a, rather than a, a, a highly frequent testing regime, they focus on um, a 60 day rule. And I've got to say that neither the UK or the USA system seem very adequate to me, and um, there's there's no real um, there's no real clear um, guidelines about which cheeses some of these things should apply to. Um, there aren't the sort of programs in place to measure the high quality of the milk in all of those jurisdictions we were talking about, and. Where they do talk about maturation conditions, like in the USA 60 day rule, it's not absolutely clear what time and temperature um, those mature, those, well, you've obviously got 60 days, but it's not, it's not clear what temperature uh, those cheeses must be held for during those 60 days. The upshot is, is that in Australia, we can do much better than this. We, we must do better than that. We must have a scenario where people can be confident that they're eating safe raw milk cheeses. 
and I'm co I'm confident that we're getting there. I won't I won't focus on the doom and gloom too much, but we need to understand that what what the authorities have got in their head. In in Australia, there's probably two recent tragic circumstances. One where um, where the consumption of raw bath milk resulted in the death of a young child and where in 2012 the Chindi Listeria outbreak was associated with three deaths and the loss of an unborn child. Um, in, both, in both of these scenarios, we either had uh, milk that wasn't of particularly high quality and on the other hand, um, with with camembert, we've got um, we've got a cheese which is high pH, high moisture, low salt, um, a, a risky cheese. There, there's a few points to make here. You know, pasteurisation on its own doesn't you know make a safe cheese necessarily because there's post handling contamination, obviously, and um, and it's you know, very quickly, obviously, a cheese like camembert wouldn't be allowed to be made with raw milk under the new standards. But in short, it really focused the attention of um, of FSANS and the authorities to really focus on, with the raw milk cheese approval system, to really focus on those two things, quality milk and the low-risk cheeses. And I think that page pretty much sums up where their where their mentality is, and of course, you know, when we we need to remember these things as first principles. Of course, we must, you know, when we're making raw milk cheese. You know, we need to, you know, it it, it almost goes without saying that you know there's got to be milk of exceptionally high quality, where there's good hygiene standards, um, where the where the um, where the process and extraction systems on farm and in factories are absolutely pristine. And, you know, especially at this, especially at the outset, you know, we need to be making sure that raw milk cheeses, the raw milk cheeses that we make are low risk cheeses. So these are, these are cheeses that have got combinations of um, low pH, high salt, low water activity. We need to make cheeses that are a hostile environment for, for bad bugs. So, this gave rise to the fact that we needed to consider a new way, a new way of, uh, of, of making cheese and understanding what makes a safe cheese. Um, we already know that um, we already know about the environmental conditions that we are detailed in the previous slide. So we know that to avoid the experiences of other places in the world, we need to start off with quality milk. We need to have a low risk cheese, secondly, that cannot be a reservoir for pathogens or pick up new pathogens. But that brings us to the third piece of the puzzle that helps us make raw milk cheese safe. And that is to understand how the pathogens grow and die back in particular cheeses and their maturation environment. So that's, that's the biggest challenge for the food, or, for the food authorities um, after the amendments of the FSANS code hit. And so that informs why the, the hurdles and the systems and the processes imposed upon cheese makers are the way they are. So in other words, you know, rather than rely on the blanket one size fits all rule like, has, like what has happened in other international contexts, the Australian authorities proposed in in this, in this environment to apply heavy advanced science, which is already understood in order to help us make safe raw milk cheese. 
you know, and I don't think we can, when it comes to the institutional memory of the food authority, we can't underestimate what a, what a big deal. Um, and salami is a very good uh, uncooked fermented meats. They're a very good example to put up here because they share many of the um, they share many of the attributes and the risks that raw milk that raw milk cheeses make. Uh, raw milk cheeses have. So what, so how did the food authorities? How did they get to a point where they have got um, where they've got confidence in the uncooked fermented meat industry? Well, they've got they've got four different they've got four steps here. So the first is that they identify the most high risk organisms. For them, it's E. coli. So then they broadly categorise um, UCFM, so salami, into, into four different types. So some of them have got more fat, some of them are higher pH, some of them have got less moisture, some of them have got more moisture. But broadly they categorise them into four, four parts, four types. Um, that then informs them of a process that they should undertake. Then they essentially test every batch of raw meat going in for E. coli, and then they test every batch of salami or other UCFM product going out. Every batch gets tested for E. coli twice, going in and coming out. And really that's, that was, that's a scenario that, um, that many of the authorities thought was going to be a pathway for Australian raw milk cheese. Um, and it's not, the, it's not the worst option, it's not the worst option in the world, but it doesn't necessarily fit in with the way that, um, with the way that uh, cheese testing systems um, and frequencies happen today. Um, but the notion of taking a canary down the coal mine, sentinel species and test it every time, which is, which is essentially what they do in many other parts of the world when it comes to raw milk cheese, is um, it'd, be, it'd be arduous, but it's, it's a, it is a method of addressing concerns when it comes to raw milk cheese. I, I think that I think that where we've got to is a much more satisfactory um, landing point. But it's just important to know that either you have a scenario where you pick a target organism and you test every time, or for instance, with Australian raw milk cheese, we spend a lot of time and effort and science understanding precisely what sort of cheese we're dealing with and then target um, a set of parameters and uh, testing frequency to that particular cheese. So they're the, they're the two paths we could have gone down. So how do we establish the pathway that we've got today? Well, thankfully, um, Dairy Food Safety Victoria, New South Wales Food Authority and FSAN uh, they co-commissioned the development um, of a that they co-commissioned the development of a of a of a software tool with a lot of statistical modelling behind it, and the work was um, performed by Professor Tim Ross um, at UTAS, and um, there's another lady called Tanya who I was just speaking to last week actually from the New Zealand Ministry of Primary Industries. But they did a lot of work and adopted a lot of science that helped us understand, especially that part of um, how pathogens can grow in a raw milk cheese and how they die back and under what conditions that might happen. Um, before I go, before I get onto this, 
the other thing that the um, food authorities um, did, which I, I think was, which I think is um, uh, a, a noble pursuit, is to try and get some agreement so that we don't have, um, you know, a, a hickledy pickledy way of um, of implementing the new standard across the country. You know, we can't. Ideally, there'd be a consistency in the approach of how we um, of, of how raw milk cheeses are approved, how they're tested. Um, we can't. We can't be having one system in Tasmania and another system in Perth and another system in Sydney. Ideally, there'd be a national approach which would ensure uh, a level playing field and it would also ensure that the lessons learnt from each um, authority um, is, is shared and cross-pollinated with each other. And I, I think that this is a, I think that this by and large is a very positive, um, it's, it's a very positive outcome to have the nation's food authorities be so collaborative and willing to have a consistent approach. But anyway, um, finally, there was some software that was developed. The software that was developed is called the Raw Milk um, decisions, the, the raw milk cheese decision support tool. The link is there. Um, if you just type that into your search engine, it goes straight. It goes straight to it. But very, very briefly, um, I'm going to. I'm just going to go through the five things that the soft that this piece of software does, and I think it's pretty neat. They've done a really good job. Firstly. Um, Firstly, you've got to make some test cheese. You've got to go away and get it tested for its physico-chemical properties. So pH, salt, water activity, moisture, lactate, fat, these sorts of things. Um, and when you put that into the model, it is solely for the purpose of understanding um, whether that cheese is conducive to pathogen growth. So is it a hostile environment for the pathogens that are pre-existing in, in your cheese and for any pathogens that it may come into contact with post-production? Um, it also helps for the modelling further down. But essentially the first step, do we, have, do we have a low risk cheese? Okay. The second part provides a gate on milk quality. So it asks for um, for standard play count, for bulk milk cell count. Um, and in the early stages, it's asking for E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. You need to have, you need to, you need to be sure that you've got good quality milk. Okay, so we've got the right cheese and we've got the good quality milk, as we spoke about earlier on in the presentation. Now, the model then starts to ask you very detailed information about how, the, how your milk is handled, what temperature it's kept, how it's stored, um, where it's transported, how far it's transported, what the average temperatures are. And initially it sort of sounds uh, a little bit onerous, but what the model is trying to do here is it's trying to it's trying to model out the growth of pathogens in your milk before it enters the vat. So it's assuming you've got E. coli, it's assuming you've got listeria and salmonella and golden staff in your, in your milk. And it's, um, and it's taking that and it's growing it um, so that it understands what the starting point is. Then the model then asks you a lot of very detailed information about your cheese making process because it then is statistically trying to determine how much those pathogens are growing in your vat. So you end up, after you've hooped cheese, you end up with um, the model, the model has predicted that that cheese 
that you've just made has a particular load of E. coli, listeria, salmonella, and golden staff. The fifth part, the final, the final smarts, is that um, is that it. I mean, it's now just it. It's already um, it, it's already calculated the growth of pathogens. Now it calculates the dieback of pathogens, and so and that dieback happens in your maturation room. So, um, so for instance. Um, you might have um, you might have a hundred days at twelve degrees, and that might be long enough for all the pathogens that have grown in handling, transport, storage, and in the vat. It, that's how it might take the cheese that long to achieve inactivation of all those pathogens. The model is good in that. You can play around with those parameters, the days and the degrees. So, for instance, you could um, you could mature a cheese at twenty degrees, and only need to hold it for seventy days. For instance, I'm saying anything, but that's it's a it's a it's a factor of time and temperature. Um, obviously, the reason why it can't be cold is because those pathogens go dormant and they won't die back in cold storage. So it needs to be relatively warm in order to ensure some dieback over time. When we, when we spoke to um, Tim Ross and when we've spoken to some of the other people that were very instrumental in the creation of the tool, we found that if, um, if a raw milk cheese is made properly, then it is no more risky um, than other than any other forms of cheese. That is that the pathogen inactivation by maturing in this way is no less effective than um, than pasteurization. So I think that this is really important. I think you know we need to we need to understand the science. Um, and once we understand the science, we need to we need to rely on it rather than uh, continually being, um, uh, rather than allowing our authority to continually be, um, be anxious in spite of the science that they've commissioned. Um, just very quickly, I'll just talk about some of the testing regime. So here we've got milk. Um, initially, the New South Wales Food Authority wanted us to test our milk weekly. We pushed back very hard on that um, because sometimes we don't even make raw milk cheese weekly, or perhaps we'd only make once a week, for instance. And it it uh, it just wasn't it just wasn't sensible, um, especially in the context of small artisan cheese makers to be testing weekly. Um, the rest of the dairy industry is used to um, testing bulk milk cell counts, etc., monthly. Um, so, um, so essentially, you need to test the you need to test the bulk milk cell count, total plate count, and E. coli once a month. Um, routinely, again, it doesn't look the the F sans. Um, there is no prescription on this on the, on the frequency of the of testing these other three organisms. It just says routinely. So. We came up with a with a six month uh, suggestion that we um, treat this a bit like we treat you know our potable water. Um, so every six months we test the um, golden stuff, El Mono and Salmonella. Uh, a little bit of a bone of contention that we that we have with our with our authority at the moment, but it's we're we're working through these things. I don't want to be. I don't want to be overly critical, but right now our, uh, the New South Wales Food Authority wants us to test for those the the four suite of uh, that suite of four um, pathogens um, every batch. And look, I'll, I'll I'll talk about this. I'll talk about that in a moment. Well, I'll talk about it now. Um, 
the reason why we didn't go down the salami route, the reason why we didn't go down the uncooked fermented meat path was so that we wouldn't have to test every batch. If we did test every batch, then it would almost cost us about $200 every batch. So it, it still is um, a minor, it, it's, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably the last sticking point that we've got with the food authorities. FSAD prescribes that, unfortunately in the FSAD's code, it left testing frequencies open-ended. It said that a testing regime of cheese should be established in consultation between the authority and the producers. And in, in some ways, in some ways that for me, that's probably the most annoying part of the, of the code. Because when we're talking to our food authorities, they're obviously in a much stronger negotiating position than we are. And ideally, because it's a new thing to the Australian market, because raw milk has had risks associated in the past, their temptation is to impose an every batch rule where it doesn't need to be. And you know, and you, you sometimes get to the point where you where you point out that if we were going to go down the path of testing every batch, well, then we could have just gone down the salami path and done that years ago and not had to have invested so much time and energy and effort and heavy science into where we are today. So I'm sure that this will get resolved, but this is, this is what we're dealing with, overcoming the, the fear factor, which I understand, but at some stage, both um, Dairy Food Safety Victoria and the New South Wales Food Authority, at some stage, they're going to have to ask themselves, are they going to believe the science that they spent vast amounts of money on, or are we going to just continue to be unduly fearful in spite of it? Um, I've only got about another five minutes, I think, before I'll open up to questions, but just very, very quickly, some of the challenges, um, animal management challenges, I, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of things, but most dairy farmers are doing those already, so I'll just concentrate on the two that are, that are uh, unique to raw milk cheese. They, um, ideally, they want you to um, teat wash every, every milking. There's, um, it's, it's uh, a, again, it's, it's, a, it's a controversial thing to put in there because many European contexts ban the use of liquid on teats pre-milking. Uh, I'm convinced that a wet teat could be a source of contamination. Um, you know, can we dry clean teats? Well, that's certainly what we're doing at the moment. Um, the other thing is silage. I mean, it's, this is especially important if you're if you have you know third party, you have if you're sourcing milk from third parties, you know, to dictate to your suppliers to start um, washing teats and to eliminate um, silage. Um, as a fodder storage mechanism. It, it could be a difficult conversation, um, especially here on the south coast of New South Wales. Um, fodder storage is, um, well, so silage, is, silage is the main mechanism of fodder storage. Um, and my last slide is cheese challenges. So these are the, these are obviously things that the food authorities and FSANs are silent on. But just between us cheesemakers, um, so some of the challenges are that raw milk definitely has a faster renaging time and uh, curd hardening seems to uh, occur more quickly. So, you know, it requires different timings, maybe different ingredient concentrations. There's more post-process acidification going on. So our first batches of Yarrowa were more Manchego-like rather than French Tom-like. Um, we need to understand the relationship between volatile compounds and maturation. So sometimes the cheese is not that, 
not that interesting at the 100 day mark and it just requires further maturation but further maturation but um understanding maybe some of those ethyl whiny compounds and how they dissipate over time that's still some of that knowledge is not quite known in this country late blowing um that that's happened in a couple of uh in a, in a couple of batches um obviously if you're going to keep cheese in a warm condition then you know, there are obviously going to be the conditions that cheese mites like as well. So that's another that's another management issue, a big management issue, but also, so it's a blessing and a curse, is that a single source environment obviously amplifies, concentrates all those seasonal variations. And how do you explain to people that the cheese they're having this week is a little bit different than the cheese they had last month? Making raw milk cheese, are we as an industry putting a target on our back? Like if the first person that randomly picks up some sort of stomach bug and just happens to have had raw milk cheese that week, are they going to immediately jump to blaming a raw milk cheese? The the thing I need to the thing that I I'm a little bit puzzled about is how do we market the difference? I mean, if we're going to cook, call cooked curd cheese as raw milk, and yet our beautiful Yarrawa cheese is also a raw milk cheese, how do we explain the difference to consumers that one's cooked and one's uncooked, and does that make a difference? Um, obviously, in a cheese making context, we've had to have separate rooms, so we mature our raw milk in a separate room, and um, We've also moved to hand salting rather than brining to avoid cross contamination. So, the um, we feel in some ways that we've had to start from scratch with our with our recipes, um, and it's not an easy process. It does mean that um, throughout that process, some batches get thrown out um, as you're trying to work out what's going on and how to how to work with. Um, the conditions of your cheese in your context. So it's it's not a cheap it's not a cheap process. We're committed to it. Um, we think that it is going to be rewarding and it's going to be good for for the industry. But um, but it it does seem sometimes like we're swimming through treacle, um, and that uh, challenges one challenge after another just keep popping up. But we're determined to push through, and we believe that, um, uh, Chris and I both strongly believe that we would like to see many, many uncooked raw milk cheeses appear on the Australian market um, in the very near future. So look, thanks for, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, I'm going to go over to the chat room and, um, and see if, okay. Um, let's have um, Alison. Alison Lansley said the Jindy cheeses were all made from pasteurised milk. Yes, they were. I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. Obviously, the the Jindy cheeses that were um, soft white moulds were were made from um, pasteurised milk. Yet, um, yet they obviously still ended up um, with a with a listeria scare. So, I'm, I'm, the point that I was trying to make with those was that. Just because you pasteurise doesn't doesn't mean that it's safe. Um, uh, Alison also says with teak cleaning, has anyone tried wood wool dry cleaning? Seems to be used a lot in the EU and the UK. Um, Burke Brandon says, you make silage. Is this fed to milkers? What have your test results been like? Have you had milk tests that weren't clean enough? Are your cellar temperature records audited to prove over 12 degrees C? Okay, so Burke, um, we do make silage and we make silage to get us through those deep winter months. Um, we, uh, we are committed to, we're, we're committed to not, make, not feeding out silage at the same time that we're, um, that we're making raw milk cheese. So, we feed out the we feed out the silage through the winter months, um, and only um, and we only start making raw milk cheese once the once
once we've stopped feeding our barley. Our, our milk tests have all come back well clean enough. Um, there are uh, in one, I think one result, we had an E. coli, e. coli in the raw milk that was, that was right on, on the limit, but then the others weren't. And that was well, it, that's well within the, um, that's well within the, um, the specifications. And are your cellar temperature records audited to prove over 12 degrees? Well, this is, this is a good point, Burke. I mean, if you're making a raw milk cheese, then your maturation environment becomes your CCP. It's not pasteurization that's your critical control point. So, so yes, we have, um, we have a data logger that sits in our um, raw milk maturation room. And, um, and it is, um, and it is always over over twelve degrees. Um, Alison Crawford says, "I'm curious if there is a way to show and describe on paper the terroir of your cheeses, biodegrams, or do you just rely on descriptors to explain flavours?" What a what a great what a great question. Um, I would love to do that. I would, um, I think, I think it's also a really good thing for us, for the industry to be able to take raw milk cheeses at different types, at different times of their maturation. Um, for instance, we've had cheeses at about the 90, 100 day mark that have got correct pH, so a semi-hard, so it, it's a 5.2 pH. Um, but, but still we seem to, we seem to have at that hundred day mark, we had some flavors that weren't particularly desirable, like ethyl, um, whiny flavors coming through and that worried us. Um, but then, uh, just the, just the process of leaving them alone seemed to make that all go away. Um, but I think we'd like. I think it would be very useful, um, not just from an end product, but also through maturation to understand, for all of us to understand, you know, what, um, what, how does a cheese change throughout maturation? What, what things, um, what things just require a cheese just to be left in the maturation room a bit longer? Um, you know, um, so I, I think that that's, I think that that's really, um, I think that that's really interesting. We, and absolutely, we'd really love to get to a point where we understood the seasonal variation in our cheese so we could say to people, see, that one was made this time of the year from that pasture, and this is why it tastes like that. So anyway, we'll, we'll put that on the, on the, on the things to do, but I think that that's a, Absolutely fantastic suggestion. By the way, um, Nick Haddo um, put on social media last week about his cheese and how it's come out so special because of what they fed the cows during the fires down there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Interesting. So Burke's asked another question there. Yep, Burke asks, uh, does keeping semi-hard natural rind cheese too long result in a final pH too high? Um, not that I've noticed, Burke. Um, so, um, but that's a, it's an interesting point and it's something to keep an, something to keep an eye on. Um, I'm, I'm happy for any, any thoughts or questions or feedback. Um, I hope, I hope every, I, I hope it was, um, there's a, there was a fair bit of information there. It was a bit of a brain dump. So I hope it all made sense. Um, Alison Crawford asks, are the different state regulating bodies working together on an action plan to support producers or, is, or does each state have a different approach? Well, at the moment, um, uh, I've been dealing with New South Wales and 
and um, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to understand, Alice, how they they say that they're collaborating amongst the, uh, amongst themselves. It's hard to know the extent of that. Um, it um, that the the food authorities want um, they want people to make raw milk cheese. They do. They're not. They don't. Um, they haven't spent all this money and all this effort um, getting to a position where there's such a sophisticated pathway to making raw milk cheeses, only to actively discourage people from doing it. So that they, it's this odd scenario where the authorities want people to make raw milk cheese but they're just still very scared. They're just still very nervous and very anxious about it, about it all. And we need, we need to make sure that, you know, we're continually talking about the science. We know that this is a very important point I didn't quite make. We, we know that the, that, that the people that, the people that made the, the, the statistical modeling in the software, they did so purposefully and deliberately um, conservatively. So we know that we know that the model overestimates the growth of pathogens um, on the way to the vat and in the vat. And we know that it underestimates the dieback of pathogens in the maturation room. So we know we have we know we have a conservative, a highly conservative model based on good science. So, um, so you know, so we need to we need to we need to back it, and um, and we need to make sure that the we need to we need to allow space for our food authorities to become a little bit more comfortable and less scared by. Um, by the prospect of more raw milk cheese in this country. Um, Alison Lansley says, I think the state regulators are a bit apart at present, but there is an Australian Dairy Regulators Forum chaired by Amanda Hill, and she has told us she wants to see them all adopting a universe, uniform approach. Here's hoping. Well, here, here, Alison, I, I can. I completely, um, I, I completely, I completely agree. Um, That's good news. Yep. That is very good news. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, with that, we have run a little over time. Um, if you have any questions over the coming week, you could, Michael's happy to answer questions. In fact, he's happy to answer questions anytime. But from the webinar point of view, um, you can shoot me an email and I'll put you in touch with Michael or contact him directly. But uh, yeah, Michael, thank you so much for all your effort. You've done an amazing job considering you aren't a webinar presenter every day and your slides have been fantastic. So with that, a big... Thank you very, very much. And, yeah, thanks, Jenny. Yeah, and folks, we really would like your feedback. So please email me and um, let me know how many people are listening from your logon and also um, your feedback, your comments, because not only do Dairy Australia appreciate it, but also Michael does. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Thank you.